Hey all, welcome back. So in this video, Deanna and I are going to address some common questions that come up with regards to intermittent fasting and other compressed feeding windows. Mm -hmm. Some of those feeding windows that Deanna particularly is fond of and has been practicing for six, seven months now with great results is eating one meal a day. I personally embark on time-restricted feeding. We're gonna dive into some of those different types of intermittent fasting patterns and address some of your common questions. The most common question from women that we've gotten recently, and I'll throw it up on, on the screen here right now, is what about your hormones? Mm -hmm. And uh, because Deanna is very lean, as you might be able to tell from either of the camera angles. And so I think a lot of women have in particular, men have this too. I'm not picking on women at all. But when it comes to hormones, I hear this more often. Mm -hmm. What about keto in my thyroid? What about fasting in my thyroid? And for women, is eating one meal a day or is intermittent fasting bad for my hormones? And you, your Deanna's body fat has noticeably changed, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say you probably dropped three or four percent body fat in the last six, seven months? Probably. I was lean to begin with, um, but I would say I'm close to maybe about 10%. And my hormones are still... I think intuitively great. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, some of the common questions that will come up with regards to hormones uh, for women would be changes in your menstruation, yep. changes in your menstrual cycle, mm -hmm. libido, uh, water retention, hair falling out. I mean, the common symptoms, and then, you know, obviously, then a lot of symptoms around menses, which you don't have headaches, fatigue, irritability. No. So uh, there's the transition phase with when you decrease your window with any kind of change in your nutrition or lifestyle, okay? So um, you may initially lose your menstrual cycle. You may initially lose a little bit of hair. You may initially have a little brain fog, but you have to distinguish between what is a uh, false alarm and what is a red flag and when to make a change. So initially, yes, it staggered a bit my menstrual cycle. When you say staggered, what did that look like? It wasn't, you know, I missed, I skipped a month didn't make, it didn't make me nervous. Again, I'm 43, so I'm done with having kids. So, and I'm in an experiment with the OMAD, still learning. So uh, it didn't make me nervous. I thought, well, I'll give it a couple months. And if I still don't get it, then maybe I'll make a change or maybe potentially add more iron or just make small changes. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't necessarily just focusing on getting my menstrual cycle. It was my libido, my energy, my strength. Um, just how I felt in general, and I feel wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, Deanna was commenting to me recently, like your libido has improved. You've noticed it's not better. that it was not that it was bad before, but you were just saying to me, uh, you know, like, wow, my libido is like way stronger than it used to be, yeah. and so I think that's important for that's a good proxy. I think a lot of us get fixated on a blood test. Yes. People with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's get fixated on. TSH and free T3 and all that. And you know, what we need to think about is our symptoms. Mm -hmm. And and you know, if fasting changes your th TSH or T3, maybe that's not a bad thing if you don't have the symptoms. And okay. so um, like you said, like you know, menstruation might change for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if if your cycle never came back, then you would have changed your diet. Yeah, yeah, I definitely would have probably got a blood test then, for sure, and um, after upping my iron. But uh, yeah, you know, when you get to, to around like your mid 40s, you know, you're approaching uh, menopause anyway. It's not as big of a concern, um, but yeah, I mean, generally everything is, you know, based on intuition. You know how you feel in general. So. Which is a big point, and the reason yeah. why we wanted to make this video is to help you all kind of think through this. Because we hear certain things that have been touted in textbooks, right? For example, mm -hmm. women have to have a certain amount of body fat in order to menstruate, right? right? And so this was, again, I got a lot of direct messages just this last, last couple of days about this. And so it's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, maybe for some people, but you are not average. You are a unique individual with unique genes, with unique epigenetic signaling, with a unique microbiome signature. Mm -hmm. So you need to experiment on yourself and try things out. Just because something works for Deanna, just because something works for the guru that you follow, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And it doesn't mean that what's been written about in textbooks for 40 years necessarily always will be true for you. Right. And so the premise of this video, the purpose of kind of this channel, High Intensity Health, is to help you yeah, gather insights and be more comfortable with your own intuition, like Deanna was saying. Right. To uh, add to parlay into the next topic we wanted to address was calories. Right. And you know, certain people want to maintain their body mass or they want to improve their lean body composition, gain muscle. Mm -hmm. So 
they're following macronutrient calculators in order to you know get insights about what their macros should be and they're eating when they're not hungry they're eating according to what a calculator says but you know what sometimes friends if you're full you're full if you don't feel like eating that extra four ounces of steak or whatever. And so Deanna had an interesting thing, you know, just come up, what, a couple days ago, where yeah. you're like, she, you know, she, she's doing one meal a day, so you're tracking your macros. Yep, so I'm eating within a two hour window. So when we say one meal a day, it means I'm eating within a two hour period, okay? It's not just I'm having like a single plate of food. And so um, I've been just, I normally don't track my macros, but since I'm experimenting, I've decided to track my macros over the last few weeks. And um, I've been trying to get in around like 100 to 120 um, grams, of grams yeah, of protein in the two hour feeding window. And so I had a bowl of protein and was eating it, was feeling a little full. And Mike had looked at me and said, you don't need to eat all of that. And I thought, you're right. I don't. And this is the problem with counting macros. I mean, initially it's probably good just to use it as to see what you're eating in general to get you on the right track, but you can't let that tell you how to eat because then you lose intuition, how to eat with intuition, which is extremely important. Um, you know, satiety is important, but you don't want to overfeed. You want to stop around 85%, even with an OMAD. It's okay. a really good point, friends, that we need to think about because for example, we can make another analogy when it comes to like finances, right? So, you know, I invest a certain amount of money every single month into investments, right? But some months, if we're doing construction on our house, uh, if we're doing projects and so forth, like you can adjust that a little bit. And so it would be not prudent financially to, if we had other expenses, uh, you know, health complication, for example, which we fortunately haven't had, but if we were doing a remodel, whatever, it would be silly to just keep investing the same amount of money and then come up short right at the end of the month and the same thing happens you know with our body if we just adhere to these macronutrient calculators uh, based upon some theoretical calculations from systemic meta-analysis based upon all these studies then we lose the signals that our body is trying to tell us and we start to override these built-in satiety mechanisms your gut hormones and feedback loops and everything like that. So mm -hmm. while on one side, tracking macros is very helpful. Mm -hmm. It gives people a great idea. Just like tracking your finances and your spending is wonderful. Right. Do you need to do it forever? Well, it depends on the person, right? right? If you're really bad at spending money, if you're really bad at overeating, you might need to track macros and or your finances perpetuity. Right. But one, like Deanna was saying, it's a good way to get a visual about your, you know, how much you're eating uh, you know, based upon initial tracking and weighing, mm -hmm. and then you can have a good insight. What does four ounces of, of grass-fed steak look like versus eight ounces, right, once it's cooked down? Because right. cooking does contract, you know, how much, you know, kind of the water evaporates and so forth. So anyway, you know, to kind of, we wanted to keep this video relatively short. There's mm -hmm. gonna be a lot more videos on this particular topic. We have a full OMAD and fasting and fitness e-course. Deanna did much of the legwork and recipes and content. So it's really geared towards both men and women with an emphasis towards women because if you look on YouTube, most uh, keto fasting people uh, that are of popularity are men. And I'd like to say that Coming Soon is a book just on OMAD. And um, the reason I had put it together was be because of the questions that I'm getting from you. And uh, it's basically going to include the macros for, for those who want the macros. It's going to talk about different, uh, what a keto meal may look like, what, what a cyclical keto meal may look like, what a carnivore meal may look like, what a keto carnivore meal may look like. And it's going to give meal plans for weight loss as well as longevity, building muscle and burning fat simultaneously and being lean and healthy all year round. Which is important. Yeah. Because, you know, even in the kind of the low carb space, you know, we see people's body weight fluctuate quite a bit. Yes. Uh, and I'm not just picking on any one person, but we, we do see this, you know, people get excited about fasting, they get excited about keto, they try it, they do great, then they go off the rails. And so the idea, friends, is to be consistent. Because when you're constantly changing your body's set point, okay, and we see this in fitness all the time, mm -hmm. You see someone looks incredible on stage, right. six months later, you're like, they look like a different person because yeah. their body's set point, the body's trying to constantly fight for that set point. So it's much easier to just stay at that same body weight, right? And it's not as sexy yeah. to say, you know, because people, 
There's nothing sexy about consistency, about being, you know, steadfast in your goals and right. being regular. It's kind of boring. Yeah. People want the quick fix. They want this. But uh, long story short, that that being said, we do think it's it's good to kind of change up how much the different macros you're getting all the time. Yes. Some days yes. are full carnivore for us. Yep. Other days, believe it or not, and sorry carnivore folks, we have vegetables. We grow and, yeah. vegetables. And you know, and again, we'll talk about this in the next book too. Is basically how to do so seasonally, um, and uh, it will talk about you know ways to do that with the carnivore plate, with the you know keto plate, and um, also cycling calories. We also cycle proteins and fats. So um, it's very possible to kind of have a mix of all different ways of eating. So. And the idea, um, and, and this is just based upon Mike Mutzel making stuff up right now, um, <laughs> but our metabolism kind of responds to uh, nutrition just like exercise does. Mm -hmm. And you never go to the gym, well, you shouldn't go to the gym and do the same exercise for the same duration, the same reps, the same volume, right. the same you know, tempo. You shouldn't do that because guess what? Your muscles adapt. Mm -hmm. And I have this sneaky suspicion, again, this, I don't have a lot of randomized placebo-controlled trials to necessarily support this, but a lot of the adaptations that occur through food are you know, using the same mechanisms that exercise ut utilizes to cause adaptations. Right. Adenosine monophosphate kinase, uh, you know, this is a key uh, inducer of autophagy, mTOR, all these, all these nutrient sensing receptors also influence skeletal muscle adaptation to exercise. And so I have this sneaky theory that we can't be too consistent, right? right. And, and look, you know, some of the clients that, you know, we, we, Jen and I share mutually, um, will say, gosh, I've been, here's my macros, here's what I've been doing for this long, and things stalled. Right. And so the idea is like, you need to add in some variety in there. Back in the day, our ancestors didn't have exactly 1,700 calories in a day, okay? So when you become more intuitive, some days you may have 1,200, other days you may have 2,000, okay? Depending on your activity. Um, but you know, being intuitive, it's not easy, it's an art. So there is a process that leads up to that. And the premise here is to teach you and your own body to do this innately, intuitively. Yes. Mm -hmm. to listen to those satiety singles, to listen to those hunger cues. And that's one of the benefits of a compressed feeding pattern. So um, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. You can subscribe to the channel. And if you want additional information, links are below to a course that we put together. We have a bunch of videos behind the scenes in addition to a 133 page ebook that's very helpful. Yep. And uh, as always, really appreciate you tuning in friends. Hope you have an awesome day. Have a great day.